What's going on internet professional Asian out here back again with yet another new video Hope all is well with everyone because today I've got with me yet another cool subtle Asian vehicle So this guy's is the 1999 Nissan female Hispanic named type R So if you are someone that's into cars especially of the Japanese variety Then you may be familiar with Nissan's ever so popular S chassis platform not just in the States But all over the world the S13 and the S14 were pretty popular project platforms in the world of motorsports Especially in the world of like drifting, drag racing, autocross, uh, those events where you compete for a $10 trophy after spending thousands of dollars of car parts with. The advantage of the S chassis platform was that its parts were relatively affordable and they were easy to work on. And most importantly, they were rear wheel drive. But even now, almost 20 years past the mark of the new millennia, we still to this day see the appreciation of the S chassis. So much appreciation in fact that some people actually do ritualistic abuse to the shells that are just hanging out in a yard, happily waiting to be adopted by a new owner. What is he doing? So while the S12 did actually make it on American soil at one point, it wasn't exactly a common car. So the other S chassis that didn't really get too much face time here in the United States was the car that I'm sitting in right now, which is the S15. Or to some others, the 200 SX, if you happen to live in the only other two countries that this car was officially sold in. If this car still looks a little bit unfamiliar, then it's also known as the purple Mona Lisa that gets absolutely destroyed in the first drift challenge of the 2006 movie, Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Ugh, man, time's a bitch. And thanks to the 25 year old importation rule, the USA is enjoying its first wave of legal JDM cars like R32 Skylines, FDR X7s, and other fantasy Gran Turismo cars. But see, having something outside that 25 year old bubble rule opens up a whole new level of JDM ego and prestige. So being someone that has a car outside of that bubble range is not only cool, but it's pretty damn ballsy as well. So if you're like driving around the United States and you kind of see one of these S15s driving around, you're basically seeing a 3000 pound bag of cocaine just drive on right past you. Kind of really do stand out a lot because not too many people have this car uh, in the United States period. And, you know, to any car enthusiast, you know, they're pretty much going to be in shock and awe, but to any other person, this car is pretty much just a really sleek looking Pontiac Grand Am. See, I grew up in the 90s, so I saw, like, the S13 and the S14 back when they were in its showroom prime. I never really saw a true Sylvia back in the day unless it was imported over from Japan. But you also have to realize that back in the day, the term drifting wasn't exactly going around like it is now. I mean, I'm sure it was probably like a big thing in Japan, but in the United States, it was a pretty seldom sport. People were just kind of like doing it on the side. So without like the explosion of social media and the power of the almighty hashtag, the only cars that you probably saw doing similar stunts were like Civics and Camrys that were power sliding at like hot dog eating contests or something. One of the more intriguing things about this car lies in the name itself. You're probably wondering how in the hell did a Japanese car end up with the name of an older Hispanic lady? Well, we had to take a small trip back through the quantum realm and right into the 60s and 70s. So now according to my 12 second research that I did approximately 15 seconds ago, it appears that the Sylvia title came from two namesakes. One being the genus of a certain warbler bird and the other being based off an old 1800s ballet. I'm not even gonna lie, I just ripped all this information off Wikipedia in like 45 seconds and just decided to put it in video form. But the fact that you guys are still watching this video with me is pretty astounding, so let's keep it going. Now here's where like the politics of like international marketing kind of come into play. The names Fair Lady and Sylvia may have been a hit overseas, especially in a respectable Asian country where it's considered rude to hand something over without both hands and bowing. So in other countries, Nissan's international marketing team probably knew that these names probably wouldn't fly outside of Japan to potential buyers. So, for the two countries that this car was legally available in, the S15 stuck with the traditional key displacement related name, which was the 200 SX. And that was based off its 2 liter displacement. You know, I kind of miss the whole naming strategy that Nissan used to do. You could usually tell the size of the engine and displacement by, you know, the name that they had. For example, the 240SX had the K24, the 300ZX with the VG30, 350Z had the VQ35, so on and so forth. Even Infiniti sort of adopted the same displacement name technique for like a while until they f***ed everything up by calling everything a Q something. So here's the fun part about the S chassis line of cars. They've all been virtually powered by the same engine for over a decade. So even the 1989 Sylvia had the same similar SR20 engine which is found in the car that I'm sitting in right now. 
Of course, in its final revision, they had better improvements like adding VTEC, uh, modern ball bearing turbo, and adding an extra gear to the transmission to make it an even six speed. So basically almost everyone in the world got this engine legally from factory except us Americans. We ended up with a torquey 2.4 liter cast iron truck engine and our S13s and S14s. The SR20 we got in the States wasn't as sophisticated as the one that, that's found in like this guy, but to top it all off, the cars that came in America with the SR20 were actually all naturally aspirated front wheel drive cars. They weren't bad or anything, they just were kind of in comparison to what they had in Japan. Of course, it wasn't too long till people in the States were swapping their own engines and casting out the cast iron KAs in favor of the lighter aluminum SR20. So doing these swaps brought American S chassis fans as close as they could to being like their J-Spec counterparts. On the contrary, there is a noble group of people who did stick to their guns and built the US spec KA engines. In fact, you can find a lot of their old and current bills from forever ago on active forums like Nico Club, Zilvia, uh, KAT.org, and some other select forums. It's kind of amazing how Nissan never really gave the US a turbo SR in the first place. We didn't get a factory turbo Nissan four cylinder car until like 2011 when they gave us the Juke. If you guys don't know what the Juke was, it was kind of like a weird Z looking crossover thing that looked like it was designed by someone that was blindfolded. But I think I've ran the clock down enough already as it is, so let's talk about this thing before I throw another advertisement on this video. So this S15, just like all other cars, was imported directly from North Korea. It's a decently pristine example and one of the only few here in South Florida. It's a 1999 spec R with just 87,000 miles and Unlike the last car I talked about, which was that super decked out R33 filled to the brim in rare expensive parts, this car is a little bit more of a modest approach. It's mostly stock. So, in essence, yeah, the bone stock S15 with just suspension and wheels, and the computer really hasn't been messed with and it still has its factory tune. Factory power numbers included are 250 horses with about 203 foot-pounds of torque, and this car does tip the scales at about 2,700 pounds. Pretty awesome looking car, really sleek looking, kind of like an advanced Pontiac Grand Am in a sense. So it's pretty much a basic S15, nothing really too much about it, it's a really really good example of a really clean uh, edition of the car, it's a spec R, no crazy wide body kits or you know, super awesome ground effects, none of that stuff, so it looks pretty much how you'd probably see it in like a video game or something. So the thing I like most about the S15 is its design. I think this car, just like the FD, has a really timeless design and it's one of those cars that just looks photogenic from almost any angle. I kind of really wonder what would it be like if, if America ended up getting one of these cars from the factory, even if it was powered by a KA24. Personally, I think if Nissan was able to give America like the S15, even if it was powered by a KA, uh, I feel like their sales would have been pretty decent. I mean, the S13 and S14 weren't exactly the best selling cars that they had, but I think you know, they were able to sustain itself for a decent amount of time. I actually did not do that much research on the sale points of those cars, so I could be completely wrong, I'm not sure. I'm just saying that because I'm totally a Nissan fanboy. But seriously, I think the car would have done a lot better in terms of sales than the Murano convertible. So to all my fellow Americans, let me know in the comments below whether you think the S15 would have been a hit in the United States or not, whether or not they were powered by the SR20 or a factory KA that was kind of revised from the S14. And all my friends that are watching this video that are not in America, comment below in great detail and let me know about the greatest pizza that you've ever had, where and what it was. The chosen winner will get a free t-shirt and a sticker sent directly to them. And unless you live in Syria or like North Korea, because I don't really mail to those I don't really mail to those places. But yeah, all in all, the S15 is one of the greatest gems in the line of classic Nissan cars. It just kind of sucks the US didn't get this car from the get-go. And since these aren't exactly federally legal until 2024, owners who run the risk of importing one still kind of run the risk of getting their car seized and crushed from the government. Although, of course, very unlikely. Uh, just, I mean, imagine that happening to you. It's like depositing 20 grand from your bank just to throw it all in a furnace. So whatever. The S15 Silvia didn't really get as much attention as its GTR cousins, but it's still a car to appreciate for the long haul. And not just because of its timeless design, but because it's the last generation of the S chassis line from Nissan. Unless Nissan ends up making an S16 coupe again, which I highly doubt, this is pretty much it. 
So when a timeline where Nissan's latest lineup is in favor of weird crossovers, unreliable theoretical transmissions, and a Z that's been basically the same for almost an entire decade, you've just got to appreciate the subtle presence of an S15. Good job, old Nissan. This car gets a 90% A+. Or, well, A. It's plus minus an A, right? Yeah. I was Asian, but I didn't exactly get the best grades in school. I was like a C student. All right, guys, before I do end this particularly dumb video, I just want to give a quick shout out to my buddy Austin over there who's sitting right behind that little car. He's also the owner of the S13 video from, like, Professional Asian 3, that, like, super pristine S13. Uh, if you guys want your own Professional Asian t-shirt along with other dumb t-shirts, hit up my website at literallyouthere.com. If you guys did like this video, hit the like button. If you guys did dislike this video, smash that dislike button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell for, like, 10 years of good luck. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. If you guys did like this video hit the like button if you guys did dislike that i feel like in that alternate timeline of america nissan would have had like way better sales and letting us have a taste of